Hello, I'm Ray. Welcome to another podcast episode. We have a sunny day. It's uh, eight o'clock in the morning. It's a sunny day, 14 centigrade, 57 Fahrenheit, 94% humidity. I'm not sure why the humidity is so high, but there we are. It is. It's 94%, 1029 millibars on the good old barometer. And the flag I'm looking at now is in the sunshine, at least. It's not moving. No, it's not moving at all. Not a breath of wind. The garden is looking lovely. All the flowers are coming up. We've got sweet peas coming up. The runner beans are doing well. Tomatoes are doing well. Everything is doing well. The fig tree now has some decent leaves on it and some small figs, which the squirrels have been eating. I didn't realise that squirrels like figs. They've been munching away out there on the fig tree, having a great time, having a feast which is good. I've been putting fewer peanuts out for them every day because they are digging up all our pots, our plants. They're digging everything up, burying the peanuts, you know, the monkey nuts in the shells. So I'm only putting a handful out each day now. I used to put out a big pot full of peanuts every day and all they do is eat some and then bury the rest. So now the idea is, the plan, is that they will eat what's there and then have nothing left to bury. And it does seem to be working. They haven't dug up any of our plants since I've been cutting down on the amount of peanuts. So that's good. How are you? Have you had a good week? Are you having a good weekend? I hope all is well in your neck of the woods. Has anything exciting been happening, I wonder? Let me know. Raiserants at protonmail.com. Be great to hear from you. Some of you have asked where midweek message number 160 has gone. 160. It kind of doesn't exist. Well, it sort of does. It's now 161. (laughs) I'm not going to go into all the the details. I messed up. All right, we'll leave it at that. I messed up. So on the list, you won't see 160. We're on 161. That's the current one. So don't worry, you haven't missed out on anything. Email from Rob down there in Australia, Melbourne. G'day, Cobber. Hello, Rob. How are you? He says, just curious, do you regularly start the midweek podcast on the hour to catch the clock chimes, or do you change the clock to chime on cue? (laughs) Ha ha, good question, Rob. The chimes are on the computer. I recorded the chime from our clock, and it's on the computer, so I just bung that bit of audio on, if you like. I bung that bit of audio on at the beginning of every midweek message. Same with the seagulls on the Sunday episode. I just bung the seagull audio on. But as for the 8 o'clock every Wednesday, 8 o'clock, that is UK time, 8 a.m., I've set the podcast episode to come on on a certain date and time. So once I've recorded it, I upload it to the host, Podbean, and then it is set to come on Wednesday, 8 a.m., regardless of what I'm doing. I could be in the Isle of Wight, which I will be soon. And when I go to the Isle of Wight, for example, the, the midweek message and the Sunday podcast will both be set for eight o'clock in the morning on the relevant dates. So that explains that. Now for a little story. I know some of you like stories and some of you don't. Now, I can't please all the people all the time, but I can please some of the people none of the time. Going back to the 70s now, I believe early 70s, a friend of mine, Ian, and his girlfriend, Jane, they planned to get married. They'd been going out together for about a year and they were obviously very much in love made a nice couple and all that business. Everyone loved them to bits. And they planned to get married. And they were saving up their bits and pieces, saving money. They hadn't told their both sets of parents that they were planning marriage. That was to be a surprise at some stage. Then something happened. Jane fell pregnant. Why do people fall pregnant? I mean, she didn't fall down, did she? Anyway, she became pregnant. They were both delighted, not what they'd planned, obviously, but they were both delighted that they were going to have a baby and they told their parents. Ian's parents were delighted. They loved Jane to bits. They were obviously concerned that she was pregnant. Were they going to be all right financially? What was going to happen? That's quite normal. But they were delighted and looking forward to the wedding. Jane's parents, on the other hand, hit the roof. Why do people hit the roof? I don't know. Anyway, they went outside and hit the roof up a ladder. You're not marrying him. You're not going anywhere near him. The wedding will not happen. I don't know what her parents thought about Jane being pregnant, what she would do with the baby. She'd be a single mum. Where was she going to live? I don't know what her mother had in mind there. 
Jane was obviously distraught. She didn't know what to do. Her parents had threatened to disown her if she went ahead and married Ian. They were both, what were they, 19, 20, something like that, 20 years old. So they weren't sort of 16, you know, they were adults. And what they agreed to do was stop seeing each other for a while. Well, to all intents and purposes, anyway. They did see each other. They'd, they'd sneak out to places and, and meet up that way. Jane was obviously getting bigger with the baby. And they were wondering what on earth they were going to do. She didn't want to be disowned by her parents. So Ian rented a flat on his own. And Jane told her parents that a friend of hers, Jenny, had uh, moved into a flat. And she was going round to see it. Jane's mum was highly suspicious, wondering what on earth Jane was up to. So she said, right, I'll come and see your friend's flat. Now, Jane knew that would happen. Ian knew that would happen. The mum was going to poke her nose in. They'd set it all up. Jane took her mum to see the flat and her friend Jenny was there. And Jenny had put some of her own things in the flat. She'd put some clothes here and there, a couple of photographs. And the mum said, oh, that's nice, Jenny. I'm glad you got your own flat, blah, blah, blah. So, of course, Jane often popped round to see Jenny, who wasn't there, of course, it was Ian's flat. <laughs> Jane was a regular visitor at the flat, her parents didn't mind at all, and she sometimes stayed overnight. Now, here's the thing. The situation was about to change drastically. As the months passed, Ian was doing very well. He was earning a lot of money, and the landlord of the flat decided to sell. So Ian bought the flat. He was doing really well, working seven days a week, electrical work, rewiring houses. He got enough money together for a deposit for the mortgage, and he bought the flat from the landlord. It was a nice flat. I went there a few times. Really nice. Now, Jane's mum was becoming suspicious because Jane had as good as moved in to the flat, and she found out what was going on. The baby was due any time now. Jane knew there was about to be a huge argument. So she packed a couple of suitcases and left home, obviously moved in with Ian. I don't know the ins and outs of what was going on. The I don't know what Jane's mother's problem was with Ian. But from what I heard at the time, she wasn't happy that Ian was self-employed and he wasn't earning a great deal of money. Understandably, she was thinking of her daughter and her daughter's future and the baby, of course. If Ian wasn't earning a lot of money, they're going to be stuck in a rented flat. It was going to be very, very difficult for them. So I can see her mother's point of view there. But to threaten to cut off your daughter, disown your daughter, that seems a bit harsh. Of course, her mother didn't know that Ian had bought the flat and he was doing very well. Now, Jane, being really fed up with her mother, it wasn't so much her father. He just, I think he was under the thumb from what I could understand it. Yes, dear. No, dear. He did as he was told. Jane's mother seemed to, <laughs> seemed to be in charge. And Jane decided not to tell her mother that they now owned the flat. I say they, Ian, owned the flat. They had a spare bedroom, which they'd made into a nursery. It was really nice. I went to see it. It was beautifully done. But of course, her mother knew nothing about this. Her mother also knew nothing about the wedding that had been planned. They got the date. They'd set everything up and they were about to get married. At the last minute, they decided to send an invitation to Jane's parents. If the parents didn't turn up, OK, so be it. At least they had been invited. On the wedding day, both her parents turned up, which really pleased Jane, obviously, and Ian. They turned up. Jane couldn't understand why, but they were very happy. They gave her their blessing, and the wedding and the reception went beautifully. Now, bear in mind, Jane's mother still didn't know that they'd bought the flat. At the reception, her mother was saying that she was concerned about the future, how they're going to pay the rent. So Jane decided to invite her parents to the flat to have a talk about the financial situation, which her parents agreed to. There was no honeymoon, by the way. Ian was too busy for a honeymoon. Plus, the baby was due, literally, any day, any minute. <laughs> I'll tell you about the baby arriving in a second. Her parents went to the flat. They were shown the nursery, which was lovely. As I've said, it really was nice. Her mother was delighted. And apparently her mother was very friendly towards Ian. She wasn't at all frosty. But she was still very concerned about the financial side of things, the money, how they're going to pay the rent. Ian then showed 
Jane's mother some paperwork. It was the mortgage for the flat, the mortgage agreement, all the paperwork for that. And of course her mother was delighted and apologetic. Oh, I'm so sorry, Ian, because Ian was doing very well. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was just thinking of Jane. So all's well that ended well. But what a story. What if Jane had listened to her mother and dumped Ian? She'd be at home with a baby, a single mother living at home. What would she have done? So it turned out very well. The baby, by the way, was born in the flat, a, a bouncing girl. I don't know the weight, I can't remember, but a little girl. They were about to get into Ian's van, his works van, to go to the hospital, but it was all too late. Things happened rather sooner than they thought. And, of course, they lived happily ever after. I do like a story with a happy ending. So many things on the telly, so many programmes on the telly, the, the story just ends. Have you noticed that? You're watching a film or something, or just a, a one-off play type thing, a drama, and it just ends. And you're left staring at the screen, wondering what on earth happened. Where did he go? What happened to her in the end? That wasn't explained. I don't know whether they deliberately do that so they can leave it open for another follow-up episode or something. I don't know. But it is rather odd just to leave something in mid-air like that. But there we are. Such is life. Do you find it odd? I also think this is odd. Disowning your daughter, chucking your daughter out because she got pregnant. I know that happened in the old days, you know, in the 50s. It was dreadful getting pregnant. Oh, disgusting. Jezebel and all this business. <laughs> Jezebel, that's funny, isn't it? These days, do you know, it still happens. I heard, what, a few years ago, I spoke about five years ago now, it was a friend of a friend, I didn't know who it was, but they threw their daughter out. She was 18 years old, she fell pregnant, and they threw her out. I don't know what happened, it's nothing to do with me, I don't know the people, but... Uh, so it still happens. That's what I'm saying, even this day and age, it still happens where the parents disown their daughter. I just don't understand that at all. I would have thought you'd stand by your child no matter what. But there we are. There we are. Things happen, don't they? Strange things like that happen. Health is wealth. Someone said to me on the radio this morning, I chatted to a friend of mine, and uh, we were talking about money and finance and bills and all this. Oh dear, the price of milk, the price of bread, blah, blah, blah. And he said, my dad always used to say that health is wealth. How right he, he is. Yes, how right he is. Health is wealth, isn't it? Obviously, you need money, but your health is more important. It looks as though we've got a, another lovely day out there. The sun is up. Where are we? Eight o'clock in the morning again, the following day, of course. Eight o'clock in the morning. Blue sky, sunshine, absolutely wonderful. I shall be putting my shorts on. I got too hot yesterday. I did. I got too hot. I felt, I think it must have been dehydration. You meant to drink three pints of water a day. I didn't do that. I was busy in the garden. I put my sun hat on. <laughs> you should see me. No, you shouldn't see me in my sun hat. I remember as a child getting sunburnt. Children did back then. You know, we'd go down the beach. We didn't have all this sun cream, all this factor five million stuff that kids have on today. And we'd just go down the beach in our trunks, you know, no hat, running around on the beach. And we'd get sunburnt. And I remember, is it calomile lotion? That stuff you rub all over the sunburn. I don't know whether it helped or not. But it wasn't at all uncommon to see kids bright red. What I do find awful that didn't happen back in the old days. I don't remember seeing it then. But these days, you'll see a mother with a, a push chair and a little baby in this, what do they call them these days? Buggies, aren't they? Not tansads or push chairs anymore, they're buggies or something, and the baby's asleep in this tan sad thing or whatever you call it, <laughs> and its little legs and feet are out in the sun going red. That's awful. There's the mother, you know, she's got her hat on and she's got her factor or whatever on so she doesn't get burnt, and their poor child's in the push chair roasting in the summer sun. I suppose these young mums just don't think about it. It's dreadful, really. Heard from my son in uh, North Carolina yesterday. He found a crayfish in his swimming pool, swimming about. I don't suppose it liked the chlorine in there, but a crayfish. I mean, what's that doing in your swimming pool? <laughs> he reckons a kestrel might have dropped it in there. I don't know. That's odd, isn't it? Very odd to have a crayfish in your swimming pool, but obviously been dropped in there by something or other. He took it to the 
a stream. There's a stream near where he lives and he put it in the stream, so it's probably going to be OK. But uh, had quite a shock. I think I would have quite a shock. Imagine finding an octopus in your swimming pool. No, I don't suppose you'd find an octopus. But that's quite amazing, though. We found things in our, our little pond. We don't seem to have a frog this year. We heard a frog a few weeks ago. Now it must be. He was going... Or like whatever they do, you know. And uh, we were thinking, well, that's good. There's at least one. Hopefully there's more than one, so we'll get some frog spawn. But I haven't heard him since. I haven't seen a frog at all. I've only heard him. So I don't know what's going on. Now, my sister, her pond, they suddenly had newts turn up. So I don't know where the newts came from. I suppose, again, on birds' legs, you know, birds carry, I don't know, frog spawn a bit on their legs. That's all it takes, isn't it? Or a bit of, how do newts, uh, do they have spawn? No, they don't, do they? I don't know what they do. But newts appeared in her pond. They're lovely. Used to go over the woods and catch newts when I was younger take them home in a jam jar then my mother would say well what are you going to do you can't keep it in a jam jar take it back to the pond oh, I wanted to keep it in my bedroom no you can't <laughs> it would die wouldn't it so she was right our mother's always right we'll say yes because there are bound to be lots of mothers listening email from Derek hello Derek over there in Kent just along the road from us well next county Derek says did you go to the same place for a holiday each year when you were a child? Did your family all go to the same place each year? No, not really, Derek. We didn't go on holiday every year. We didn't have a lot of money back then, so we didn't go every year on holiday. To be honest, I I loved the holidays. We went to Wales in a, a caravan, stayed in a caravan there and various other places. I think it was always Wales or the West Country. Yes, um, one of my aunties lived in the West Country. Bridgewater, Somerset, we used to go there, stay with them. They had a huge farmhouse, that was lovely. But I was quite happy to stay at home, as I am now. I love the Isle of Wight, of course, as you know, we go at least once, if not twice a year, to the Isle of Wight. Back then, I think we only went away when my parents could afford it, which, of course, wasn't every year. People have said, that's interesting, that, Derek, because people have often said to us, why do you go to the Isle of Wight every year, sometimes twice a year? Why don't you go somewhere else? We have been to other places. We've been to Kent, the New Forest, Somerset. You know, we've been all over the place. Uh, Norfolk, we stayed up there. Cromer, up where the crabs are. We've been all over the place. We've been to Spain. We've been to Portugal. We've been to Cyprus. You know, we've been everywhere. I've been everywhere, man. But the Isle of Wight is just down the road. It's an hour to the ferry, then three quarters of an hour across the Solent, and you're there. So in less than two hours... We're on the island. And, OK, we can't get into our place till four o'clock, unfortunately. But what we do, as soon as we arrive on the island, we head somewhere for lunch, have a spot of lunch, have a look around. Then what we do is we go to our place, dump the old ladies. I mustn't say that, must I? Dump the old ladies. <laughs> yeah, we, we plant the ladies in the cabin, the sort of, what do you call it? I don't know what they call a lodge or something. We install them in the in the lodge, put all our cases and stuff in there. Then we go to Morrison's. That's a supermarket for those of you abroad thinking, what's Morrison's, a pub? You dump the old ladies and go down the pub. No, 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 of course not. Perish the thought. So we do a little bit of shopping, then we go back, and that's our first day there, really. Then we've got the evening to enjoy, hopefully having a beer, sitting outside in the sunshine. Even though we go to the island every year, we still haven't seen all of it. We have a look on the map or online at uh, just look up things like places to go on the Isle of Wight. And we find places that we'd not heard of, never been there before. So Trish, she does her itinerary, you know, she works everything out. She works out the food, the meals that we're having every day because she does the cooking. She works out what meals we're having. <laughs> she works out where we're going every day, what time, what time we've got to be there, when they open, when they close. It might sound daft, but it's really handy because we've got the, the elderly ladies with us. They like to know what, what's going on. They don't want to be out in the evenings, of course. Now, luckily, it works out really well because Trish and I don't want to go pubbing or clubbing in the evening. We would rather sit at home. I say at home, you know, in the lodge place. Perhaps sit outside on the veranda thing, have a drink. 
it's just lovely. It's relaxing. You know, it's just relaxing. I don't want to go down the pub in the evening and I don't want to go out for a meal every night. You know, some people do. That's what it suits them. That's fine. But that's not something that we would want to do. And of course, the ladies don't. The ladies, as Trisha's mum, as you know, and her friend. Her friend's 86 now. So we have to be considerate. We can't say, right, we're going for a 10 mile hike. Mind you, she'd probably do that, and I'd be the one struggling. <laughs> oh, a friend of mine's mother. At Amberley, there's a steep hill, a very steep hill. Now, this lady, she was, what, in her 80s, and I was in my 60s. She'd get to the top of this hill, and I was struggling. They'd all get to the top of the hill, this lady, uh, Trisha's mum and Trisha, they're all up the top of the hill. I finally get to the top, puffed out, like, I tell you. I made it, I made it. And they're all saying, oh, well done, Ray, well done. You You did it, you got to the top. And I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute, I'm 60-something and there's this other lady, she was 80-something. It's well done her, not me. <laughs> it made me realise how unfit I was, actually. But we do have to take the ladies into consideration, you know, where we're going and when and what we're doing. But it always works out very well. It's great. Looking forward to it. One reason I was puffed out, well, the main reason I was puffed out up that hill at Amberley Museum is because I smoked for 42 years. They reckon I've got COPD. What's that? Coronary something, whatever, disease. Well, they did say it's on the cusp, on the verge or whatever they call it. So I've sort of got a bit of COPD. They gave me an inhaler thing. I don't use it. I don't get puffed out enough to use it. If we do go out and we walk up a hill, I'm OK. I'm fine, I don't use the puffer. So I was very lucky. 42 years of smoking, I got away with it. I didn't end up with anything dreadful. Some people, of course, they have all sorts of problems. Well, it kills some people, doesn't it? Smoking kills. So, yes, I was very lucky there. Talking of cigarettes, of course, back in the 50s, when I was a boy, in the 50s, everyone smoked. Just everyone. Parents, grandparents, Everyone, wherever you go, people are smoking. You watch a programme on the telly, they're all smoking. You go into the pub, it's full of smoke. It's just everywhere. And it was it was almost a natural thing to do. You know, you get to sort of 14 or whatever age and you, you have a cigarette and you just carry on smoking. I don't think it was so much that it was extremely popular. It was just what you did. You left school and you smoked or even smoked at school. <laughs> In some cases, it was just a natural thing. Whereas these days, of course, it's uh, it's the other way round. Back then, anyone that didn't smoke, well, they were weird. You don't smoke. Oh, how odd. How strange. These days, it's the other way round, isn't it? You smoke. Oh, dear. That's not good. Why do you do that? How, how odd. <laughs> it's all changed. It's all reversed, hasn't it? Back then, my parents smoked. My neighbours smoked. Friends of the family smoked. Everyone smoked. Some of the school teachers smoked, sitting up the front of the class with their ashtray while we're doing boring lessons and things. They're having a fag. Imagine that happening these days. Well, it wouldn't, would it? It would be instant dismissal. The teachers smoking at the front of the class. People did a lot of things back then that they don't do now. They had a lot of things. Everyone had a record player. They are few and far between these days. Everyone had a transistor radio. Tape recorders, I've been banging on about my reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder recently, as you'll be aware, all too aware. <laughs> now, they weren't as popular, of course, as record players because they were expensive. Reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders were very expensive back in the day, even though I was in the trade and I could get sort of second-hand stuff fairly cheap. It was still quite a lot of money. And when the first cassette tape recorders came along, I think it was Philips bought out their little cassette machine they were very expensive. Of course, everyone wanted one of those. They were fascinating. They were amazing little bits of kit. But they were expensive. That would have been mid sixty. I think 66, 67, the Philips cassette came out. I might be wrong there. Might be plus or minus a year or two. But mid-60s. And, of course, you get a lead with it that you could plug into the back of your radio if you had a decent VHF FM radio. You plug the lead into the back of the radio and then record your music direct from the radio. You got a microphone with it, but that was a waste of time. You can't, well, you can. People used to record music from the radio by standing the microphone in front of the radio, and it sounds dreadful. It's awful. So it was far better to get yourself a decent radio and then plug it direct 
into the tape recorder. You're not picking up all the background noises that way, you know, your mum shouting for the kitchen. I thought you were going to help with the washing up. Come on, what are you doing playing around with that machine? <laughs> You've got all that on top of uh, uh, one of the records you're recording. Do you remember that when you were a child? Your brother and your sister. It was normally uh, myself and my sister because we were the, the oldest out of the four. One of us would have to wash and one of us would have to wipe. Always arguments. I'll wash. No, I'll wash. No, you wipe. All right, I'll wipe. Always arguments. My mum would say, I don't care who does what. Just get on with it. Just do it. And then we'd be grumpy. <laughs> I remember my mum saying one Christmas. This was when I was about 18. She said, are you going to join in this Christmas? Are you going to participate this Christmas or just do your own thing? <laughs> I said, I'm just going to do my own thing. Oh, that was funny. I was good, actually, as a teenager. I wasn't bad. I didn't cause trouble for my parents. You know, I, I just sort of got on with what I was doing and that was it. It all worked out very well, actually. I think parents have to worry more about daughters, especially these days, of course. But even then, they had to worry about daughters. If I was out till midnight when I was, I don't know, 16... Well, mind you, I was at work when I was 16. I started work at 15, so it was very different. If I'm out to midnight, it's with the lads from work and we're clubbing or whatever we're doing. My parents weren't worried. But, of course, if my sister was out at 15 or 16 years old at midnight, they were worried. You know, where is she? What's she doing? What's she up to? Is she all right? Starting work at 15, as I did, changed everything. One minute, you're a schoolboy... And you've got to do as you're told, you know, you, you're you not going out. No, you're not doing that. You're doing this. The next minute, you're out at work and you're kind of overnight an adult, even though you're 15. I remember that. I was just suddenly at work and not under, I was going to say under my mother's thumb. Obviously, I still lived at home, but I was working. I would get in from work and then perhaps go out in the evening. It was just a total change from being at school. i get in from school, I'd have to do as I was told. We're doing this, we're doing that this evening, or no, you can't do that this evening. No, you're not going out. Then the next minute I'm at work, I'm going out with the lads. Okay, all right, see you later. <laughs> it's amazing. The change was fantastic. Do you remember that? Do you remember the change from the transition, that's the word, isn't it, from school to work? Raise rants at protonmail.com. Let me know how you got on with that. I do remember at the time being at work, the first few weeks I was at work, you know, one of the lads saying, oh, we're going down the pub tonight. You'll see you there about half seven, eight o'clock. And I'd say, yeah, OK, see you there. And I'd tell my parents. They'd say, oh, where are you off to? I'm going down the pub meeting the lads. And I was 15. Things were very different back then. There are lots of people in the pubs at 16, 17. You had to be 18. I think in America it's 21, is it? Well, varies from state to state, doesn't it? I'm not sure. But here, it's always been 18 before you can go into a pub and drink. I think you can go into a pub with adults at 16 and have soft drinks. You can't go in below 16. Mind you, these days, they're restaurants. They take kids of kind of six, seven, eight years old into pubs, so I don't know what the rules are now. There was also a rule or a law that if you did take someone in under age... They couldn't go up to the bar. They had to be at least two, was it, or three yards or something back from the bar. They weren't allowed to cross that line. Not that there was a line on the floor. They couldn't go any closer to the bar. They had to stay two yards back. I don't know how they get on with all these rules now because the pubs are now restaurants, a lot of them, and they're full of families with kids, so I don't know what happens there these days. Something else, I wonder whether it happens these days or not. We used to get a policeman would come in. A policeman would walk into the pub and he'd look round and if he thought someone was underage, he'd go over to where they were, see what they were drinking. I don't think anyone ever got nicked for it. I think they just got thrown out. You know, go on, get out of here. You're not 18. Get out of here. <laughs> Evening all. <laughs> I do remember coppers going into pubs, especially at closing time, because it was strict. On a Sunday, close at eight, uh, 10.30. Then he said 8 o'clock then, struth. And you had to finish, I think there was, was it 10 minutes drinking up time? Don't quote me on that, I can't remember. Of course, in the week it was 11 o'clock closing. And if you're found drinking after hours, 
Not only would you get nicked, but the landlord would. I think they changed the rules in the end, because the landlord would get nicked, even though one of his staff had served someone after hours. They then changed it so that the member of staff, the bar person, they would get nicked for serving after hours, whereas before it was all down to the landlord, which of course wasn't always fair if he'd gone to the cellar or if he was busy with some customer or other. He's unaware that one of his staff is saying to someone, go on, I'll serve you a pint. Don't worry, no one's looking. I know it's after hours, but that's fine. There you go. So they had to change the rules there. I don't think I've been in a pub at closing time for years. <laughs> it just goes to show you that I'm getting older. I was often there till closing time when I was younger, but now I don't even know what time. Is it still 11 o'clock in, in Britain? I think it's still 11 o'clock. I know some places have extensions and all sorts, but uh, stone the crows, 11 o'clock, I should be in bed. I remember when mobile phones first came out and became popular. They were expensive, of course, originally. I remember a chap I knew, he wouldn't take his to the pub. And I said, why not? Surely a mobile phone, when you're out, do you need it? No, no, no. He said, no, my wife can phone me and ask me what I'm doing, where I am. <laughs> of course, these days you can track people, can't you? So she would see exactly where he was, unless he turned the phone off, of course, or turned the tracking thing off. But he was adamant he was not going to take his phone when he went to the pub. He said, what if I go somewhere else? And I said, what do you mean somewhere else? He said, well, I don't know. I might, I might go somewhere else. I don't want her to know where I am. And when I said to him, well, I suppose that works both ways. She might not want you to know where she is. And his face, his, he just sort of stared at me, a blank expression. Oh, Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> what sort of marriage is that? They don't trust each other. Tricia and I have this uh, app thing on our phone. What's it? Find your friends or I don't know what it's called. Find your friends or something. So we can see where each other are. Her sister's on there and a couple of other family members are on there. It's handy. It's handy to know where people, not so much where they are, but when they're coming back. For example, Trish will be coming back later on today with her mum. They've been in town. And I'll have a cup of tea ready for them. I'll just have a quick look. I could follow her mum as well. I could just see where they are. Oh, look, they're round the corner. I'll make a cup of tea. That's all we use it for. And it's very useful. In fact, it's quite handy. If we phone her mother and there's no answer, and as far as we're aware, she is at home, we can have a look on there. If she is at home, if it shows her on the map as being at home, and she doesn't answer the phone, then we start wondering why then we'll either go there and check her or someone else will. So it's got its uses. It's not just, <laughs> it's just, it's not just for spying on people committing adultery. <laughs> Number one daughter and her hubby, they're in Germany at the moment, and we can have a look, see where they are. Quite interesting. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, we can see where they are. You know, it's, it's good fun. I like it. I remember many years ago, I took a little two-way like radio walkie-talkie into the pub. I just had it in my pocket. And Trish had one at home. We still use them these days. We still use them now. And I was just in this pub. I'd gone to meet a friend of mine. And he said, what's that for? And I said, oh, it's for chatting to Trish. And he said, what, you mean she can call you on the radio and ask you what you're doing? I said, well, yeah, but she knows where I am. She wouldn't ask what I'm doing, would she? She knows I'm come here to meet you. I'm standing in the pub. And he said, oh, I wouldn't want my wife to know where I was. I wouldn't want her to call me. This was before mobile phones, of course. Well, I wouldn't want my wife calling me when I'm in the pub. <laughs> and I thought how odd that was. I don't know what people get up to. What do the people do when they go to the pub? What are they up to that they, they don't want their wives to know about? And do wives do things that they don't want their husbands to know about? There's a thing. Now, here's the thing. Raise rants at protonmail.com. What are your thoughts on that? Do you sneak off to the pub and turn off your tracking thing or whatever it is you've got? Or don't you have that tracking app? I've just had a look on my phone. Trish is down by the pier with her mother in a coffee place. <laughs> I don't suppose they're up to no good. They're probably just having a chat, enjoying a cup of coffee and enjoying the sunshine, of course. I'm going to put my shorts on in a minute and get out into that garden. What's the weather like where you are? I know I've asked this before. Rob, down in uh, Australia, Melbourne there. What's happening down there? It's your winter time coming up. Always makes me laugh, that does. I think you must have been listening to the podcast for a long time, Rob, because we've talked about summers and winters many times, haven't we? Over the years, in fact. So 
you're probably one of the very early listeners from the, the beginning of the podcast episode, which is well over five years ago now. So your winter's coming up. And of course, when we get to the end of our summer, then you're saying to me, oh, it's warming up. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, no, we've got months and months of cold blizzard, snow, ice. No, no, let's not talk about all that. Let's enjoy the sun while it's here. Now, did I tell you, I can't remember, I have just heard the other day that the April here, April was the hottest on record. How could it be the hottest on record? All it did was rain. I think I might have mentioned that earlier, didn't I? I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about half the time. I know that, you say. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we have to put up with listening to it. No, you don't have to put up with listening to me. You can switch off if you want to. No, don't switch off. We haven't finished yet. Mark, over there in Ireland. To be sure, so I did. Dublin. How are you? Nice to hear from you the other day. I was going to ask you, how do you play music on your podcasts on YouTube? Why don't you get done for copyright? On the videos I make for my radio hobby, you know, amateur radio and stuff, if I have a snippet of music, up flags the thing. You can't do it. That's copyright. <laughs> You're going to get busted. We're going to send the copyright cops round to your house kick your front door in and drag you off to jail. That's if I've played two seconds of music. So how do you get away with that, Mark? The reason I ask is, people have said to me, can you play a snippet of jingles or something from the pirate stations? And I thought, well, I better not do that because the copyright thing will pick up on it, you know, and I'll get busted. There must be a way around it, Mark, because you play entire videos of bands from the old days and stuff. Don't worry, I'm not going to start playing music in every episode. It's just, as I say, some of you have said, have you got any of the jingles? Wonderful Radio London, Radio Caroline, stuff like that. I have. I've got loads of them. Radio North Sea International, Swinging Radio England. I've got loads, but uh, it's just a copyright issue. So perhaps I can get round that somehow. It's now 6am exactly, Friday morning, the 10th of May 2024. And it is an absolutely beautiful day. It's fantastic. Not a drop of wind. I just heard on the radio, London on Sunday is going to be 26 degrees. I think today we've got a high of 22, which is much better. Just had an email from Gary, not Gary the tortoise. Oh, he's out and about, by the way. Six o'clock in the morning. He's stomping around the garden, eating weeds and having a great time out there in, enjoying the early morning sun. Gary from Newcastle. Hello. Lovely to hear from you. Gary says, what is it with apostrophes these days? My pet subject, Gary, you've hit the nail on the head here. Gary says, why do people, for example, write, I bought a bag of apples, apple apostrophe S. I was born in the 1960s. 1960 apostrophe S. It's incorrect. I know, Gary, I know. It really does annoy me. I don't normally let things annoy me, but it's so prominent, this misuse of apostrophes. Not only us ordinary people, you know, us commoners, <laughs> the man in the street. Hello, something's digging. Sorry, I can't say the man in the street, can I? The human person in the street. But on news articles, in newspapers, these are supposed to be journalists. They can't get it right. Stone the crows. If they can't get it right, who can? Anyway, won't bang on about that. It's just one of those things. Nice to hear from you, Gary, anyway. And you're not alone in your annoyance. There's a word. Can you say annoyance? Yes, in your annoyance of the misuse of apostrophes and lots of other punctuation come to that. Turn the volume down if you are of a nervous disposition. I'm going to tell you something. I'm sitting, <laughs> I'm sitting here in my shorts. My shorts and a T-shirt. I know it's only six in the morning, but it's beautiful. I'm going outside in a minute. Trish has gone off to the supermarket to do the shopping. So I thought I'd take the opportunity of the quiet household. There's not a sound, apart from some birds singing outside. Isn't that wonderful? Not a sound. So I shall spend a little while chatting with you, and then we're going to have breakfast on the patio. I'm just thinking back to when I was a child. I don't think we ever had breakfast in the garden. We didn't have a patio as such, but we had a, a paved area. I don't remember having breakfast out there or an evening meal or lunch. I don't think we had lunch in the garden. This al fresco business, I think, just didn't exist back then. These days, of course, 
People have breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, you name it, drinks, everything outside in the summer. Of course, back then in the 50s and 60s, barbecues, in Britain at least, were unheard of. People just didn't eat outside. One thing we did do, which was probably a bit common, but not to worry, we'd walk along, <laughs> walk along the street eating fish and chips. As a kid, I'd go down the chip shop with sixpence. Tanner's worth of chips, please, mister. <laughs> and we'd get, what was it called? Crackling, was it? Not pork crackling. Um, bits of batter. You know, he had a load of batter that he'd hook out of the deep fat fryer thing and he put it to one side and you could have a load of batter. It didn't cost you anything. He was going to throw it away anyway. So we'd have a tanner's worth of chips. A tanner, by the way, was sixpence in the old money. So a tanner's worth of chips in newspaper, of course, in dirty old newspaper with ink all over your fingers and grease and, oh, wonderful, calories, newspaper ink. <laughs> Those were the days we knew how to live then. None of this health and safety, none of this hygiene stuff, go and get filthy over the woods, then eat your fish and chips with your fingers. Nothing like it. Seriously, though, I don't think anyone had any food outside in their gardens. People weren't outside people back then. Obviously, in the summer, you might sit in the garden. Kids would play in the garden. But adults, I don't remember adults sitting out there. Am I wrong? Have I got some sort of mixed up memory about that? I just don't remember my parents sitting out there, perhaps with a cup of tea and a jam sandwich. Oh, nothing like a jam sandwich. Don't get me on jam sandwiches. Jam sandwich and a cup of tea in bed at night. Wonderful. <laughs> Bliss. No, stop it. I'm trying to lose weight for the Isle of Wight. That hasn't worked. I decided I'd lose at least half a stone. Nothing's happened. I lost a couple of pounds and that went back on again. What is it with this weight business? I suppose it's jam sandwiches. I remember my father in the garden. He was always doing his vegetables plot and his raspberries and black currants and red currants. He grew a load of stuff. We had a big garden when I was a child, a very big garden. He had a huge greenhouse full of tomatoes and cucumbers. So he was always doing that. And my mum, I don't know what she was doing. Housework, I suppose that's all they did back then, wasn't it? Cooking, washing up, baking pies. Some of my mum's pies, cheese flan. Oh, wonderful cheese flan. She used to make, I must stop talking about food. I haven't had breakfast yet. I'm starved. We did quite often have picnics back when I was a child in the 50s, early 60s. Picnics were a great thing. A lot of families did that. Pack up the picnic hamper, you know, the wicker type basket hamper thing. And in there you'd have sandwiches and cake and perhaps some pie or, or whatever, you know, mum had cooked. And a flask of tea, of course. Drinks for the children. Not cans of drinks. We had our own. What did we have in the way of drinks? I think we had orange juice or lemon and barley, that sort of thing. Orange squash in bottles glass bottles of course but not plastic bottles and we'd all head off in the car on a picnic somewhere just go to the local woods you didn't have to travel miles go to the local woods or a nice field there were regular spots there's a place in arundel where the tree had fallen over it's literally horizontal it's fallen over in this field just as you go down the steep hill into arundel heading west look to your right just before the railway bridge I don't know why I'm saying this. I mean, there's people listening in America and Australia and New Zealand, every all over the world. Anyway, if ever you happen to find yourself driving west as you come down the steep hill into Arundel, just before the railway bridge and the railway station, look to your right and you'll see a fallen tree. Now, that was there in the 50s. The tree is alive. It's growing. And it has been there since I was a child in the 50s. We would have picnics there. I don't know whether it's farmland or what it is. It's just a field. It's never been touched. And we would go there, park the car. There's a little lane that goes to, where does it go to? Somewhere or other. Burfham, something like that. We'd park the car there and have our picnic and climb all over the fallen tree. And it's just amazing that it is still there. Probably what is even more amazing is that the tree is alive. It must have some of its roots in the ground, obviously. I'll have to have a look next time I'm out that way. I'll park the car and go and have a proper look. And there were other places, a load of places where you could easily park. Of course, you can't do that these days. Parking your car is just a nightmare. But there were loads of places you could park your car, wander into a, a field, or perhaps sit by the edge of some woodland in the sunshine and have your picnic. These days, of course, a lovely summer evening, 
You can smell barbecues and things going on outside cooking, outside eating, all sorts of smells wafting around the place. It's, it's lovely. Smoke coming out of people's gardens, you know, where they've just lit the barbie and they're getting ready to cook their burgers and things. Whereas back then, the only thing you could see and, and smell, there was smoke and there was the smell of burning things, but it was people's bonfires which wasn't really fair. I don't know whether it was legal, but people would have a bonfire on a, a summer evening and this smoke, got, and you'd hear windows being slammed shut, you know, because people didn't want their houses full of smoke. I do like the smell of a bonfire. It's lovely, burning wood. It's lovely, not burning rubber tyres, that stinks. <laughs> but burning wood is a lovely smell. It's a country type smell, isn't it? It reminds me of the woods. No, we mustn't go on to the woods again because... Uh, You'll get bored. Right, what else? Where are we? We're three quarters of the way through. Look, 45 minutes. It's getting even hotter outside and I'm getting even hungrier. Email from John. Hello, John. I haven't answered this yet. My first car was a 67 Morris 1100. What a rot box. Just like the Mini. I had a Morris 11, uh, Austin 1100. Same thing. And the advert for double glazing was so annoying. Buy one, get one free. Oh, yes, that's right, John, abbreviated to Bogoff, B-O-G-O-F, buy one, get one free. Very rude, and he says, no need for the shouting. Exactly. Yes, Bogoff, that's right, buy one, get one free. <laughs> Dear. Catherine, lovely to hear from you from Pennsylvania. You say you're enjoying a beautiful, breezy, 75-degree day on your back porch after mowing the lawn. Now, there's a, a picture. Perfect. 75 Fahrenheit. What's that in centigrade? I don't know. The lilacs have bloomed and smell fresh. Oh, oh yes, that reminds me. Her blueberry bushes are getting picked bare by the birds. She tried a net last year, but baby robins got caught up in it while learning to fly. So any suggestions? How can you stop birds eating blueberries? Well, they eat our raspberries. The funny thing is sparrows eat the leaves on our raspberry plants, whereas other birds eat the raspberries. So what can we do? Nets are no good because birds get tangled up. Anyway, let's hope someone comes up with an answer. Lovely to hear from you, Catherine. A lot of people have put off growing vegetables and things like raspberries and that because birds eat them, slugs eat them, snails come along and eat them. Then you get caterpillars. We grew savoy cabbages last year. They were absolutely beautiful. Huge savoy cabbages. Lovely. And then one morning we went out there, they're covered in caterpillars. The cabbages had virtually disappeared, just covered in, in caterpillars. So that was the end of that. We managed to save a little bit of the hearts because so mainly the outer leaves have gone, but a whole crop of cabbages was ruined. 75 Fahrenheit, by the way, is about 24 centigrade. So that's nice. That's a nice temperature, isn't it? Moving on, we saw a programme the other day about dinosaurs. I know it's nothing to do with the 50s or 60s, and going back 66 million years, not 50 years. Can you imagine 66 million years? It's hard to grasp that concept, isn't it? That's when the dinosaurs became extinct, because that's when this asteroid came hurtling towards the planet and smashed into Mexico. I think he said it was Mexico. I was wondering how the dinosaurs all around the world became extinct. OK, Mexico was exploding you know into a, a massive shower of molten rock but how did that affect things the other side of the planet you know around the other side of the world what happened was seismic shock waves went through the earth through the middle of the planet and caused earthquakes all around the place earthquakes what is it to some it's tidal waves we used to call them tidal waves and the wind how about this i'm not quite sure how they know but 600 mile an hour winds Obviously, just ripped forests to bits. And here's the thing. There were little lumps of molten metal, about the size of a small ball bearing, trillions of them from this impact. They all showered up into the air. Lots of them just went off into space. But they rained down all over the planet. And they were red hot. They were white hot, some of them, as they came down. And, of course, they set fire to everything. So all the forests were burning. There's tidal waves this Tasami things, there's earthquakes, and the sun, this is amazing, because of all the dust and debris in the air, the sun was blotted out for 10 years. Stoner crows. 
without sunlight. Of course, any plants that had survived were, were killed. They just died off. Everything came back, though, because some roots and some seeds were under the ground, so they, they came back slowly. Some animals that had burrowed under the ground or lived under the ground, some of them were OK. Mm. So life wasn't completely wiped out from the planet. I don't know what that dinging was. That's my phone going mental. I had a phone call this morning. Inland Revenue, HMRC. Unless you contact us immediately, we're going to take you to court. Press 1 to contact us. Yeah, right, near yeah, my foot. <laughs> I just deleted that and blocked them. All this uh, spamming stuff going on. Dreadful, really. So, yes, some life did survive. The dinosaurs didn't. They're in the forests and wherever they are, and it's all catching fire and burning down and the winds and stuff. But a very interesting program, really interesting. They reckon that the dinosaurs had kind of ruled the Earth, I think they said, for 130-something million years. It's difficult to think how far in the past, how long ago that was. How many sleeps was that? <laughs> how many sleeps? One thing I would love to do, I would love to go back, say, 100 million years. No people. No cars, no roads, no houses, nothing. Absolutely nothing touched by humans. Just animals and the forest and the woods. It must have been an amazing place, our planet, before we turned up and started wrecking stuff. I'd love to go back 100 million years and have a walk around. Of course, places like the Isle of Wight that I'm going to, if you look on the map at the Isle of Wight, you can see where it's broken away from the mainland. It's like a jigsaw puzzle piece. It fits perfectly. Just push it north slightly and it'll fit back into its place where it came from. A lot of the land masses we have now were all joined together. I think at one stage, wasn't it one huge land mass? I forget what they call it. And it all broke apart and formed North and South America and Europe and stuff like that. Australia, New Zealand, all drifted apart. Something else I found amazing. The asteroid hit in the spring. Now you're saying, how do you know it's the spring? What, what was that then? 5th of April. <laughs> it happened in the spring. They can tell that by looking at plants and other things that got fossilised because the plants were just about coming into bud, for example. It must have been springtime when that happens. That's when the, the flowers start coming out and leaves start growing. And they've got that from fossils. So they knew that the asteroid hit in the springtime. Isn't that amazing? It really was an amazing programme. There we are, enough about, I don't know why I'm going on about dinosaurs. I just thought you might be interested in that. One more email before I go. This is from Charlie. Hello, Charlie. I don't know where you are in the world. Charlie says, why do people say should of instead of should have? I don't know, Charlie. I was going to say something rude then, but I better not. I should have gone to work yesterday is the correct thing to say. But people say I should of. It's not should of, I know, Charlie, I know. We'll have to have an English lesson one week, won't we? A midweek English lesson. <laughs> no good asking me, I don't know nothing. Uh, in it, or what? <laughs> Happy days. Oh, we've had our breakfast, by the way, sitting out on the patio at the table there. Lovely. 18 degrees it was just now. And it's still only, I don't know what, the, well, the clock stopped. Well, that's a lot of use, the clock stopped. Anyway, it's very early still, and we had breakfast on the patio. And guess who came to join us? Well, apart from Gary, he came to join us. A little robin. He's been hopping around the garden for the last week or so. They're very tame, robins. He came and actually sat on the table while we're both eating our breakfast, sat there looking at us both. So I gave him a piece of bread, which he enjoyed, then he flew off. But it's amazing that he actually joined us at the, the breakfast table on the patio. Al fresco, love it. I'm going to say goodbye now, coming up to an hour. Look, I've been waffling too long. You'll be saying, thank goodness for that. I can't take much more. <laughs> Happy days. I shall see you on Wednesday. We'll have another chat then, see what's been happening. Take care, look after yourselves. Be good, be bad, don't get caught and all that nonsense I come out with. Listen out for the, yes, Rob, listen out for the clock chimes on Wednesday. It's that time again. <laughs> it's a recording on the on the computer. How about that? See you Wednesday, everyone. Take care. Raise rants, by the way. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Bye-bye for now.